Hey guys, so Tuesday of this week, uh, I made a video called um, Why Protestantism Always Leads to Liberalism. And in it, I just mentioned um, Saddle, uh, Saddleback Church, a Southern Baptist church um, that the pastor, Rick Warren, ordained three women as pastors in 2021. And I said, you know, as, as conservative as the Southern Baptists think they are, they haven't uh, expelled this church. They haven't thrown this church out of the, den the uh, denomination. They warned them that they would by said, but it's been like two years and they haven't done it. So uh, that was Tuesday. <laughs> On Wednesday, uh, the Southern Baptist Convention uh, announced they expelled that church. <laughs> so... I don't know if they ever responded to my criticism or if it was already in the works, but within 24 hours of me saying they didn't do it, they did it. So uh, just for the record, they did it. I give them props uh, for following the Bible in that regards. Um, but in this video, I want to explain to my Catholic brothers and sisters exactly what the Southern Baptist Convention is and how they come up with their decisions. And I want to explain to my Baptist brothers and sisters why, if I were to bet, if I had a million dollars to bet today, I would bet within 10 years, maybe even less, uh, the Southern Baptist conventions will allow uh, pastors to be women. And within 20 years, they'll be uh, allowing pastors to perform same-sex marriages. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So what the Southern Baptist Convention is, it's a group of churches that are each independent. You know, each church is run like a democracy. The members of the church vote on the elders, the deacons, and the pastor they want. And that pastor leads in the spiritual teachings of the church. But if the church feels like he's not doing a good job, like a democracy, they can vote him out very independent. Now, what makes them Southern Baptists is they, ha they have to abide by certain Southern Baptist beliefs and sign on. Yep. Well, you know, they're Southern Baptists, you know, and it used to be, I, I think it's so true. Like if you became a member, you had to sign a statement that you wouldn't drink alcohol either. You know, there's like rules you got to follow saying I'm a Southern Baptist. I won't do this. You know, I was a I preached in Southern Baptist churches. I've hung out. I've fellowshiped. I learned under some great Southern Baptist pastors for years uh, before I came home to the Catholic Church. But I never became a member. You know, I used to always say, you know, my membership is in heaven. You know, I'm a Christian. I'm not a Southern Baptist. I'm not a Pentecostal. I'm not, not anything. You know, I'm just a Christian. That was my thing, you know. And most of the... You know, but when I hung out with the Southern Baptists, they knew I believed everything pretty much they believed, unless they were Calvinists. Uh, then I didn't believe that. And, you know, if they, if they believed the gifts cease, you know, Holy Spirit gifts, that's another thing that most Southern Baptists, I think that's, it wasn't official teaching, but, you know, like 10 years ago, they allowed missionaries who speak in tongues to become missionaries. They used to ban them if they spoke in tongues, but they allowed that because a lot of these missionaries were going into places where there's a lot of spiritual warfare, Africa and India and you know, God gives us gifts, spiritual gifts. You, you know, we're not fighting against flesh and blood, so we can't fight them with our intellect. We got to fight them with the Spirit of God. So that Southern Baptist actually allows charismatic missionaries. So, but that all being said, uh, get, just getting back to what some of their beliefs are. Again, they believe that each church is free and independent, but they have to agree on the essentials of the faith. And this is... Um, you know, one of the things I used to say when I used to preach in these churches, uh, I used to love to quote who I thought it was St. Augustine, St. Augustine. I live by St. Augustine, but St. Augustine. Uh, I used to say this quote until some scholar had to go ruin it and tell me, no, that quote isn't attributed to St. Augustine. It's actually a, a her some heretic who was trying to justify his heresy. <laughs> but the quote is, um, in the essentials, there must be unity. In the non-essentials, liberty and in all things, charity. And I always thought that was, that was great. Like in the essentials of the faith, we, we got to be united. You know, you can't call yourself a Christian and not believe Jesus is God, you know. But in the non-essentials, you know, whether you think, uh, you know, you should be singing loud and boisterous or you should have a somber, 
you know, serious prayer like the Presbyterians, you know. And that's not essential to the faith, you know. But in all things charity, love each other. Don't be judging each other, you know. Just love each other, you know. If you disagree, disagree, you know, with the motive of helping the person, not with the motive of hurting the person. So, essentially, Protestants go by this. In the essentials, there must be unity. But every Protestant has their own essentials of the faith, you know. So, apparently, the Southern Baptists still, at this point, believe it's essential uh, for pastors to be men. And, the, and, you know, they can prove that using the Bible. Now... I used to fellowship with Assemblies of God. You know, again, I was really involved. I got to teach and preach in this church as well. And, th and this Assemblies of God church that I was in, the pastor and his wife became very close with my wife and I. And we were so conservative. I can honestly say if I would have met Tim and Steph Gordon, I would consider them liberals. <laughs> That's how conservative. I don't even know if you could call what we were conservative. We were so crazy i guess you would just call us legalists you know so and if you don't know who tim gordon and steph gordon is they're very a very conservative couple i had tim on my show a couple times he's, he's a great author i got a couple of his books they were phenomenal and uh he's a very conservative youtuber and his wife is very conservative but i'm just saying compared to my wife and i and this pastor and his wife and and the flock that we led together they would be considered liberal so you know everybody's got their own you know, spectrum where they're at. But as conservative as we were, and it was an Assemblies of God church, you know, we're all spirit-filled, tongue-talking Christians, um, Bible-believing Christians, you know. If it wasn't in the Bible, we didn't believe it, you know. Uh, the denominations Assemblies of God would allow for women pastors, you know. Because the denomination as a whole, and again, it was set up like the Southern Baptist Convention. Each church was independent. You would have the the church members would vote for the elders, deacons, and the pastor, you know. And, you know, we voted for a very conservative pastor, you know. I always laugh. I said back then, I think, I, you know, looking back, I think I could have started the first Baptocostal church ever. <laughs> I would have taken... You know, the strong, expository, exegetical preaching of the Southern Baptists with the spiritual gifts that uh, the Assemblies of God knows so much about it and put it together and called it uh, the first Baptocostal church. And I think I think if I had the right band playing worship, I think we could have been a mega church. <laughs> and I say that jokingly, but it's true. It's true, you know. But uh, anyhow, thank God the Lord protected me and brought me home to the Catholic Church. You know, sometimes, you know, our egos, our, our pride gets in the way and we, we think, oh, this is what God wants me to do. But, you know, God has a way of humbling us when we truly seek the truth. And um, so now the reason I think uh, the Southern Baptist Convention is going to go liberal, like all Protestant churches eventually go liberal, is of what Steve Ray, one of my favorite apologists we've had on, on this show, Steve Ray says it better than nobody. He gives the example of the one-legged stool. And he says the problem with Protestantism, they cut off two legs of the stool. So Christ started the church and there were three legs holding up the stool that we sit on. And the Protestants just chopped off two of them. And so the, 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 you can't sit on that st stool without falling over. And the only thing I could add to that great analogy is the stool always falls to the left. <laughs> it always falls to the left. So what he means by that is when Christ started the church, he gave us a visible physical church that we could see of course we're all connected by the holy spirit my southern baptist and the assembly god brothers and sisters or my brother were connected by the holy spirit we have christ in us with the holy spirit in us but jesus came and became a person flesh and blood you know when he healed people he would use material he was he loved his creation and 
he created a church, a visible church with a leader. And he said, your name is Peter, the rock. And on this rock, I will build my church. Jesus builds a church, but he builds it on Peter and the other apostles who pass it down to uh, the bishops throughout history. And now we know the church has authority because it talks about it in the Bible. You know, uh, Jesus said that if, you know, if your brother sins against you, try and fix it. But if you can't fix it, basically, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, bring it to the church. What church? You know, the Southern Baptist Church. But what if you say, oh, my brother wants uh, to, or my sister wants to be a pastor and she's a woman. And the Southern Baptists say no. So, okay, so go to the Assemblies of God Church. And they'll say, oh, okay, it's okay. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so he created one church and he gave that church authority. And uh, you see it clearly in scripture. So that's, uh, so the church, what we call the magisterium, all the bishops in union with the chief bishop, the Pope. And you say, oh, there's no Pope in the Bible. Pope is just a, uh, an affectionate word in Italian means Papa, Father, you know? And St. Paul said, you have thousands of teachers, but I became your father. And that's why the church for 2000 years referred to our spiritual leaders, our bishops and our priests as fathers. Very simple. So that's one leg of the stool they cut off. Like there's no authority but the Bible. It's Bible alone. And to this day, I've never met a Protestant that can show me in the Bible alone where it says Bible alone. <laughs> and the second leg that they cut off was sacred tradition or what we call apostolic tradition. The tradition passed down from the apostles. You know, I'll say, oh, Jesus said, um, you know, traditions of men are bad. You know, so he said that. Yes, traditions of men are bad. But St. Paul said apostolic tradition is good. St. Paul in several places in the Bible com commended the uh, uh, Christians for following sacred tradition, uh, apostolic tradition. Several places he told them, you know, follow the traditions that we pass down from you, that I pass down to you by either word of mouth or by written word, which would be the New Testament. And it's funny because my Bible believing, Bible alone, I'm Bible believing, we're all Catholics, you got to be Bible believing, um, don't want to accept tradition, sacred tradition passed down from the apostles. But when you ask them where the Bible came from, they have no answer. The Bible came from sacred tradition. <laughs> you see, the New, the, 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 the New Testament didn't get officially put together until 382 AD at a Catholic council called the Council of Rome. You see, they were on the persecution and the apostles were writing letters in the first century and then the letters were you know, being recopied uh, by other Christians and they passed them around and they sent them through the churches to encourage the churches. But at the, they had to decide which, which letters were actually inspired by God and not just good you know, there, there's a, there were a lot of good letters uh, that a lot of people were reading in church. They thought they should be able to read in church. You know, uh, St. Clement, he was first century. He was taught by the apostles. Uh, St. Ignatius of Antioch, he was taught by the apostles. And they, they, they have letters, and we still have those letters. And they're, you know, they're authentic. Historians tell us, yeah, these, these are real letters. And they're good letters. They're encouraging. So we, we, we kind of get to understand what the first century church was like. But the church decided they weren't inspired by God and did not put them in the New Testament. How did they know that? They knew that through tradition, sacred tradition passed down from the apostles. So they, they knew what was inspired by God and what wasn't. And, you know, you see today, like these New Agers come out with the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. And historians say, yeah, these are not authentic. These were written like hundreds of years after these people were died. But the church knew that before they had all this scientific dating. How did the church know that? In 382, they rejected. They didn't even debate whether these, they, they rejected those gospels out of hand. They knew they were false doc, uh, gospels. How did they know? From sacred tradition, you know? So if you say you don't accept sacred apostolic tradition, then you can't accept your Bible. If you don't trust the Catholic church, you can't trust your Bible. It's as simple as that. So... So the church that Jesus Christ established 
has three stools. The Bible, well, we have the magisterium, you know, the, the authority of the church, sacred tradition, and the Bible that came from sacred tradition. <laughs> you cut off the authority of the church, you cut off uh, the uh, tradition of the church, you have one leg and that's why you fall. And that's why all these churches are falling, they're becoming more liberal, they're becoming uh, heretical. And this is what happens when it's Bible alone and not Bible and tradition and the magisterium. And, um, you know, you guys have these, de you know, you might think it's cool. You get to vote on your pastor. But where is that in the Bible? <laughs> you, you don't hear you don't hear churches uh, nowhere in the Bible talking about voting on who their pastor is. You know, I, I was in one Southern Baptist church and I was like, this guy came in with a resume, you know, and, and they're, he, you know, they're talking that we had a vote on this guy and they're talking about his resume and they're saying how great he is and how he's, a, you know, he builds churches and he raised money. And they're talking about this guy like we're hiring a CEO of a, of a company. And I was thinking to myself, I just heard this guy preach. This guy sucks. He was like a horrible preacher. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, he don't have the gift of teaching, you know, shouldn't the first thing to see, okay, is, does he have the gift of teaching, you know, and, you know, look at his character. We don't even know the guy, you know? So back then what I said, I raised my hand and I just kind of like, they're like, okay, next question. I said, you know, shouldn't we get to know this guy first? Like ask him if he would just come and preach, you know, for a few months without any pay. And they just looked at me like I was crazy. And I'm like, okay, next question. <laughs> I wasn't a member anyway, so I had no right to vote. I was just, you know, it was right after he preached, they had a meeting, so I hung out. But that, that what I was saying wasn't biblical either. The Bible says, St. Paul tells Timothy, find godly men and he gives requirements and lay hands on them and, and pass down. It's what we call apostolic succession. And the Catholic Church is the only church that has it. You know, our Eastern Orthodox brothers who, who split from us have it as well. But as far as apostolic secession goes, that means that my bishop was ordained by his bishop, who's ordained by his bishop, and eventually leads to one of the apostles, apostolic succession. That's how we know we have the authority that Jesus granted us. Then we have an unbroken chain of teaching. We can look at what was taught in the first century. None of our doctrines and dogmas have changed. What Protestants get confused is some disciplines, like our Eastern Rite Catholic brothers allow priests to get married, our Latin Rite, which is, you know, big in the West, don't. But that's just a tradition. You know, I'm sorry, that's just a discipline. It's not a doctrine or a dogma, so we can change that. None of our doctrines and dogmas have changed, unlike Protestants that change with the wind, you know? So we have that. And then we have an unbroken chain of our chief bishop. You can just Google all the popes. I think Saint, uh, I think Pope Francis is like 266. But you can Google Peter, Linus, who's mentioned in the Bible, actually, Cletus, Clement, all the way down, all the way up to Francis. So we can prove apostolic secession. Is the Catholic Church perfect? No. <laughs> was Were the apostles perfect? No. In fact, the first financial scandal was before Jesus even died. Judas Iscariot sold out the Lord for 30 pieces of silver. So there's always been scoundrels. There's always been saints and sinners in the church. And Jesus said that. But he said he's not going to pull out all the sinners because, you know, you pull out the weeds, you pull out some good grass. He's going to wait to the end. When is the end? Nobody knows when the end is. But when the end comes, he'll separate the goats and the sheep. You know, so I want to talk to a few specific Baptists right now. You know, you know who I'm talking to. You know, the late Keith Green said going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to McDonald's makes you a hamburger. What makes you a Christian is loving the Lord with all your heart, soul, and mind. What makes you a Christian is loving your neighbor as yourself. If you are seeking the truth, listen to me. Ask the Lord to guide you. Because just like I did for 30 years, I missed the heart of the gospel, the fullness of the faith. Jesus clearly says in John chapter 6, If you eat my flesh and drink my blood... I will abide in you and you will abide in me. If you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will have eternal life. You're missing the source and the summit of our faith for 2,000 years. 
the Eucharist, the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ, he literally turns the communion host into his flesh, blood, and full divinity. It's a supernatural miracle that happens at every Catholic Mass, 365 days of the year. You are missing out on so much. Please, if you are a Bible-believing Baptist and you truly love the Lord, exegetically study John 6 and ask the Lord to show you the truth. And if you're a Protestant Christian or a Catholic Christian, please, if you're buying or selling real estate, go to realestateforlife.org. Because one thing all Christians have in common, we believe that God created life and no man has a right to take an innocent life, especially an unborn child. God bless and stay Catholic.